Um, hi, Gloria. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you for being here and for letting me interview you. This opportunity felt so unreal, I think, to me, and I was so nervous that it only kind of hit me about 20 seconds ago that it was really happening. So um, it's, it's a real treat for me, and I know everyone here is very grateful for all that you do and that you continue to write and speak publicly, and I absolutely loved... Uh, my life on the road. Uh, I wanted to start by asking you a few questions about your life and, and you personally. Uh, in the book, uh, you say that you didn't go to school as a child and that you traveled a lot with your mother and father, uh, who is an antique dealer. Do you think that this kind of unique experience enabled you to see the world differently, differently more imaginatively? Uh, do you think that it has any bearing on what you ended up mm. doing with your life? I think the absence of school, which I regretted at the time, you know, I wanted to go to school like the other kids, you know, like I saw in movies, people lived in houses, not in house trailers, you know. <laughs> uh, but in retrospect, I think it was a kind of good thing because I missed a certain amount of brainwashing, uh, <laughs> uh, especially as it has to do with gender, which was very, is still true and was way more true in my childhood. So it's odd how the things that you regret sometimes turn out to be the things that you celebrate. And also, um, the traveling part uh, turned out to equip me well to live with insecurity, which is a good thing. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and to lead to a life I never would have imagined because, of course, I spent a fair amount of time rebelling against that part of my life since I wanted to be like the other kids. Uh, but I, it, it allowed me to be a feminist organizer on the road. Um, I think anything that when you're a child that makes you different is, is really difficult. And then... Well, would you like to address that? <laughs> <laughs> I knew this was going to happen. No, no. Um, no it's true. I no, mean... but I'm serious because I think it's so important, you know, that we understand that uh, we can't control what happens, but we can use what happens. Definitely. I think, I mean, just to be incredibly superficial, I used to hate that I had strong eyebrows as a nine-year-old. I desperately <laughs> wanted to pluck them and make them two very thin lines. And, um, you know, you come, to, you come to embrace these things. And my mother desperately tried to tell me that it gave my face character and that if I made them two thin lines, that would be a shame. And, but, you, you know, you don't, you don't listen. But... Um, I think also I spent a long time trying to pretend that I wasn't like Hermione when, of course, I was rather like Hermione and, <laughs> and finally, finally have come to accept this fact. So, um, and it's made me, you know, it's, it's made me who I am and, and now I celebrate. So, um, yeah, I think that's, all, that's an interesting journey. Um, you didn't go to school, but you did go on to go to college. You went to Smith. What was that experience like, having not sort of had a formal education? Uh, well, it was heaven at first, you know, because they gave me all the books I wanted to read and three meals a day. I mean, you know, and I couldn't <laughs> understand why everybody else was complaining. <laughs> uh, it, it was great. Um, I felt a little insecure, though, because I had come from a high school that was, um, how shall we say, it was, the, the main thing about it was its football team, let me put it that way. And, and they were so football crazed that you could stay until you were 22 if you played football. Wow. <laughs> Otherwise you left to work in the factories or to get married or something. So to have come from that kind of high school into Smith made me kind of socially insecure, but fortunately I didn't know enough to be really insecure. <laughs> because, you know, after Christmas vacation, people would come with tans, you know, and, and I would think to myself, gosh, I didn't know so many people lived in Florida or California. <laughs> so um, it w was falling in love with books and also uh, reading Aristotle about how women are so immoral, immoral or weak, we break mirrors, we, you know, th th there was not only not women's studies, there was no break on um, male dominant studies. Right. So, I was going to ask, sort of, 
when, when did you first, what did you encounter your first feminist text? Can you remember what the first thing that you came across that started to shift? Well, it should have been Virginia Woolf, I suppose, because I did read Virginia Woolf then, but she herself was misunderstood then, you know, in a way. I mean, she was treated as neurotic uh, instead of understanding the abuse she'd suffered in childhood and so on. Uh, so I think that all of my idealism and hope for change fastened on other countries, which is why I took a course on India, which was very rare because we were then almost always studying European countries, not any other, right. Colonialism was alive and well in our curriculum. You know? <laughs> um, and so my idealism centered on India, which had just then recently become independent, and it didn't center on me at all. I didn't understand that I had any role to play except to be of service. Um. So you went on to, well, you started as working as a journalist, and then at some point you kind of segued into the sort of much broader, larger um, activism. I'm interested in how you yourself, when you, when you think of yourself, how do you self-define? Do you... Well, I, I still call myself a writer because it's what matters most to me, even though the truth of the matter is I spend more time on the road organizing, you know, doing other kinds of, of activism. But uh, I have to say that writing is still the one thing that when I'm doing it, I know I shouldn't be doing anything else. <laughs> as much as I love uh, and am excited by organizing and seeing uh, groups suddenly become, I mean, okay, here, here we are, we're each looking at each other's backs, uh, we are in a hierarchy. Hierarchy is based on patriarchy. Patriarchy doesn't work anywhere anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and so, in groups like this, it's great to suddenly see uh, discussions emerge and people, somebody over here asks a question, somebody there answers it, uh, it announcements of upcoming troublemaking meetings, the feminist library is about to close, right? And there's a demonstration against its closing. Hello, right as we speak. Okay. Yes, <laughs> so, as we, yeah, as we speak today. Right. The, yeah. the rent was... Uh, the rent was increased. raised significantly, um, I think, by sort of 10 so, to 12 So it's pounds. just, it's yeah. the, I mean, the writing is personal, but I'm very grateful that, the, that I couldn't get published what I thought I hoped to publish about the women's movement, and therefore I ended up in desperation going out to speak, even though... I thought I was going to die, and That's still... That's how I felt when I first gave my speech. I was really <laughs> convinced that I was going to die. Um, it was... Well, all I've learned is you don't die. But I you still, don't die. I still you lose my saliva. Is that, your, is that a symptom of nervousness Oh, do you, you get really dry mouth? Right. Each tooth gets a little Angora sweater on it. I can't get it. <laughs> <laughs> I just shake, and I'm just really embarrassed and conscious of the fact that I can see... Pe that people can see me shaking. So trying to keep my hands out of view is part of... And then I try and introduce them later on so that I don't look really stiff. <laughs> and then... Um, and also just my mind goes blank often if I'm very nervous, which is really frustrating because I would have prepared for something a lot <laughs> and, and then my mind will go blank. Um, but, but is that different yeah. for you when you are s being a different person? It's interesting. It's been both the most liberating and terrifying thing, speaking authentically for myself as Emma, um, but, but also terrifying. There's a freedom in speaking somebody else's words and, and pretending to be someone else. But also, you kind of... It's, it's not as meaningful. It, it, I mean, it's, it's a transcendent, amazing experience. I love what I do. But um, to speak from my own experience was, was really meaningful to me, yeah. And, and I think it's so remarkable and admirable that you've taken a year off <laughs> from, you know, admirable <laughs> work uh, to do feminist activism, to do the United Nations campaign. It, it's really... 
how shall I say, even though you're acting another role, mm -hmm. I think people come to know you on screen, right? And I think we trust you. I hope so. And that is why... <laughs> I hope so. That, that is why it is so uh, great and important that you are taking that trust and putting it to work by giving out activist information, by doing lists of books for you know, that's, that's very precious and unusual. Don't you think? Well, I mean, I guess if there were anything I had to hide, it would have come out by now. I've been, it's been... Um, yeah, me too. Yeah, I mean, it's been a, I've been in the public eye for a little while now. It's been pretty crazy, but um, it's great to get to do this, to get to do this with it. Um, I'm, I'm interested. You've spoken about the fact that marriage laws once meant that marriage wasn't equal for men and women, but that feminists and the feminist movement has managed to change marriage enough to mean that it is possible to have an equal marriage. Um, but I'm, when, when we enter into it, there are all sorts of traditions that come along with it, and I'm interested in how, how do you have a marriage that is authentically, genuinely grounded in equality, mutual respect, uh, for the idea of if you do want to have a family or you do want to have a career or and what do you see as being the kind of booby traps or, or the kind of um, the minds that might that might be involved in that for, for a feminist? Well, that's a, a big question and you know, yeah. we all get to answer it in our own lives um, But it, it is important that the law is more equal now in, at least in our two countries, it's still very unequal in many others. But if I had married when I was supposed to get married, I would have lost my name, my credit rating, my legal domicile, and most of my civil rights. So it, it, we have made that part equal. Um, and we have marriage equality. It's very important that everyone who choose, chooses to marry is able to marry. At least we almost have marriage equality. We're on our way to marriage equality. Um, but there is still the pressure of the outside world that when you leave your door of your household means that you are treated differently. Uh, women, who, women with children are way less likely to get to be employed. Mm. And men with children are way more likely to be employed because they are perceived as responsible and women are perceived as distracted. <laughs> so I, I think it's, it's not going to equalize completely in isolation. Mm. And, and we need to help each other make changes. You are far ahead of my country in terms of uh, parental leave. You know, we have no such thing, really, not even for maternity. I mean, you know, we're way behind where, where you are. Um, and the Scandinavian countries are ahead of where you are, so we can, we can learn from each other. But I really, it, you know, if, if uh, you choose to have children, I don't think it's possible to have a real equal marriage until men are raising children and are as loving and nurturing towards children as, as women are. And I'm, I'm not, I think we are not just saying that for the sake of women or men, and men want to be close to their children, it's for the sake of the children, because if they do not see that uh, a, a male human being can be loving and nurturing and patient, they won't know that that's possible. Mm. And if they don't see women outside the home being uh, achieving and daring and so on, they won't know that that's possible. I mean, we do what we see way more than than what we're told. So, you know, we're, we're moving forward slowly, and uh, I think that's probably the only way we can, because if we're, what, what happened to us in our childhood is also normalized, and so we go as, for, as far forward as, as we can. But at another level, it's really, it's also important, because the family is, if we don't have democratic families, we're never going to have a democratic society, ever. 
And if we don't eliminate violence in families, we're never going to have a violence-free society outside either. So it's not just about mm. equal relationships yeah. and, and families. It's deeper than that. Um, the last, actually, I'm going to skip around a little bit now that you've brought that up, because the last time that we met, you gave me a book um, called Sex and World Peace, which I think has got to be one of the best titles I've ever come across. It's the two things we want, right? It is. <laughs> it's true. But I got to the fourth page and had to put the book down because I was so blindsided by this statistic. Um, I couldn't really wrap my head around it and then spent the next 10 minutes trying to Google it and like see if it was really true. And it really is grounded, in fact. But there are now 101.3 men to every 100 women on the planet. So women are no longer half of humanity. I'm quoting the book here, but it says, more lives are lost through violence against women, from sex-selective abortion, female infanticide, suicide, egregious maternal mortality, and other linked sex causes, than were lost during all of the wars and civil strife of the 20th century. I can't, I can't even wrap my head around that figure. So, all of the wars and civil strife of the 20th century. So, from this perspective, the greatest security dilemma, then, is systematic, kind of social devaluation of, of female life. Um, I'd never come across a statistic like this. I, I had not understood that we were literally affecting the balance of the population of, of the world and, and how that population is made up. Um, do you think, am I, just, am I just way behind? Do you think other people understand the kind of effect that we're having and that it's kind of on this scale? No, I don't think so. I, 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 I don't know. I'm not asking for a show of hands, but I bet that statistic is a surprise to a lot of us here, right? Uh, and this book, which is a wonderful book, Sex and World Peace, uses a, a great image, which is uh, a bird having two wings. And if one, if one wing is broken, the bird, bird can't fly. Right? So if the female half of the human race is not as safe as and in balance with the male half, we yeah. can't fly. And it, it also points out that the best indicator of whether there will be violence inside a country, in the streets and so on, or whether that country will be willing to use military violence against another country, is actually not poverty, not access to natural resources, not religion or even degree of democracy, it's violence against females. Not because female life is any more important than male life, it's not, but because uh, it's what we see first, it's mm -hmm. what in the family and in the house, it, you know, the whole idea that it was, it's okay for one group to dominate the other is normalized by that. So it, it's, it's important not only to females per se, but to everybody that we um, look at the microcosm of, of violence that is, and, and sexualized violence in war zones and for all these reasons that we are no longer half the human race. It's crazy. <clears throat> I mean, I often get asked with regards to gender equality, I mean, really in the face of terrorism and war and poverty and climate change, you know, is gender equality really, is that really what we should be talking about when um, these awful things are going on around the world? And I have my own answer, but I'm interested in yours. Um, it often gets pushed down to mm -hmm. the bottom of the agenda. Oh, well, we'll figure this out, and then when things are better, we'll address the issue of gender inequality. Um, why do you think it should be? Because it's the, the basis of, of all those other things. <laughs> Excuse me? It's, it's what normalizes domination uh, earliest in life. It's, it's, what, um, uh, it's what has created the bullshit idea that there's feminine and masculine. Hello? There's human. And, you know, m men who 
have, through no fault of theirs, been born into this, come to feel that they have to prove their masculinity, especially by superiority to women, but also by superiority to, to uh, other men. Uh, the, the single root, biggest root cause of global warming is forcing women to have children they don't want and increasing population beyond, you know, if you let women decide what, whether and when to have children, it, it evens out just slightly over replacement level. Where, wherever I know of in the world that women have been, because it's a health issue, you know, it's your, it's your body, it's a health issue. And forcing women to have children they don't want, which much of the world is doing, is, is the biggest cause of global warming. There's not one single thing on that list that isn't fundamentally about the status of half the human race versus the other half. What do you say when they say <laughs> I mean, yeah. Mine is a little long, okay, but... <laughs> <laughs> well, I try and soundbite it, which is really just to say what you said at the very beginning, which is that all of these issues I see as being or I keep learning over and over and over again, are directly linked to and caused by um, these other issues. And they're, they're intrinsically connected and linked, and they have to be part of the conversation. I mean, how different would the world be if there were women involved in peacekeeping and in... Um, treaties and, you know, in those negotiations. I think they would be really, mm. really different if we had, um, if we had women involved. Um, I just do. Yeah, I no, we, no, I it's, think it's, we're really good at it's that. not that we're so wonderful, we're not, but we don't have our masculinity to prove, you know, so, so uh, that the Irish peace women or that the women's movement in Liberia was able to make, you, you know, yeah. it's, um, it's just true, it's absolutely true, that there is a better statistical chance. I mean, all the studies show that if you put men together at a table, they will choose the most aggressive role, even if it's wrong. And if you put all the women, only women together at a table, they will choose the most conciliatory, even if it's wrong. So we need each other, you know, in order to have all yeah, of the... You need a balance of the two. You need a balance of both. Yeah, I think um, you should get madder at those people who you ask think? you that. <laughs> okay, <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> I'll try. I'll try that. It's interesting speaking about um, anger, which we are told is not feminine, and you know, I think you talk about in my life on the road. This is one of my favorite anecdotes, which is that when you get really angry, you start to cry, and I do the same thing. That's really embarrassing and really annoying, and. I loved how, and you also talked to Lena Dunham about this in Lenny, and I loved how you said that, you know, what we should strive to do is to say, I'm crying because I'm angry, not because I'm sad. Don't confuse the two, and, well, I'm sure there's a little bit of both, both in there as well, but um, I'm curious whether you have actually managed to pull this off in your own I have life to confess now. that I haven't. No, Gloria, <laughs> no! <laughs> I need you. No, but to but I, I'm, I, I am going to. I am going to. This, the, the, uh, the woman who told me that was a, 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 an executive in an all-male situation, and she also cried when she got angry. I, I bet there are lots of people here who have this. Right, okay. I think it's because we hold it in for so long, and then when we finally let it out, it's like a loss of control. And she f figured out that she should just talk through it. Yeah, and to all her male colleagues, you may think I am sad. No, I am angry. <laughs> <laughs> My face is saying one thing, but it means something uh, this different. Is, this is the way I get mad. And she says it works. Yeah. All right. So uh, I am absolutely going to try it. I mean, so, so far I haven't been in that situation where I've had to keep going. Yeah. Because I don't work in her kind of situation, but I'm going to do it. We it's should right. both take the pledge. We should, because it's interesting. <laughs> I did a scene recently for a director where we were kind of, there was like improvisation involved and, and whatever else. And so my character was meant to cry in this scene. And, during the, and about halfway through, he came up to me and he said, why do you keep apologizing after you start crying? It's not in the script. And like, why are you doing that? And I was like, I don't know it. For me, that's such a natural 
thing is to start immediately apologizing to whoever I am that I'm kind of expressing this um, expressing this emotion. Um, so maybe if there were less shame around shame around the crying mm -hmm. connecting. Yes, with why the is anger. there shame around crying exactly? I mean, I think that people who are watching a horrific event and don't cry ought to explain why. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, I agree. I love to cry. I think crying is great. Um, it, it also re releases stress chemicals, as we know. You know, it's, uh, it's good for you. Okay. So, Justin Trudeau just made his, sorry, Trudeau, just made his uh, cabinet 50-50. And this is awesome. Uh, I'm, I was kind of hoping there was just going to be this landslide where every single other government in the world decided that they were going to do this as well. <laughs> Unfortunately, that hasn't been the case. But do you think that, you know, men like this taking the lead and sort of saying, I don't think this is right, I do think we should have parity in our political institutions, do you think, do you think it will start to have an impact? Well, I, I hope so. I mean, he had a great answer when asked why. He said, because it's 2015, which it then was. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, and I think we do need to recognize, uh, based on sex and class and ethnicity and caste and all kinds of things, that if, if, we, if our ruling bodies don't look something like the country, there's probably something wrong. Uh, but it's going to, but and, it's going to take a very long time, which is okay, because we're going to have a lot of fun fighting the revolution. <laughs> you know, it, it is going to take time. You know, I'm, I'm comforted by the, the Native American in, on my continent. Uh, the, I, they always say, you know, it takes four generations to heal one act of violence because it's normalized in that way. So, you know, I, I do think we need to celebrate how far we've come and take a long view at the same time that in the moment we do everything we possibly can. It's not to hold back, but it's also not to be discouraged at the slowness. Yeah, having spent a little bit of time with you, it was really funny, the first time we met, I, I went away and I, and I went and saw a friend and she was like, what was she like? What, what was Gloria Steinem <laughs> like? I was like, well, she was just really zen. Like, you, ju <laughs> you just seem, on the one hand, the, no, cha the I challenge seems... I haven't made seems it to zen. I haven't made it well, to zen. Well, <laughs> it looks good from where I'm sitting, but the challenge at times seems sort of like insurmountable and, you know, we are climbing Everest and can we see the peak and, and whatever else. And you've been doing this almost your whole life and you, on the one hand you're so engaged and mad as hell and like totally in it but at the same time you have this amazing kind of sense of patience and this amazing kind of aerial view of it somehow and I'm well I you know I I don't want to make us patient okay I want to make us no. impatient but but I do think Okay, here's, here's what I think at the moment. <laughs> that the, um, Marx and Engels were really nice guys, okay? But they made one big mistake, I think, which is to say that the end justifies the means. In fact, the means are the ends. That the means create the ends that we're gonna get. So if we want, um, humor and love and uh, good food and uh, dancing at the end, not that there's an end, but you know what I mean, at the end, right? Then we want humor and food and good dancing along the way, otherwise we won't have it then. So, and, and we'll burn out on the way. So I, I mean, I'm not saying I'm a model of doing this, but I do think that the, um, the process, the friendship, the craziness, the ahas, you know, when you suddenly realize something, uh, the sense that you're doing what you love, that you forget what time it is when you're doing it, you love it so much, uh, that you just, just, just keep going is the most moving to me. And when I see people at the end of their lives or the end of their rope and they pick themselves up and they go on, it just makes me cry, you know, it is so, 
um, it's so miraculous and it's so much what we need to do. It does make me cry. <laughs> <laughs> Would you say that's like, that's like a Gloria kind of mantra in a way, just never, 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 never give up? Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Um, and, and dance a little. And dance. <laughs> Dancing is good. Um, I want to ask you about porn. Um, I want to ask you, we had a really interesting email exchange recently, very recently, about the difference between pornography and erotica. And one of the most interesting things that you explained to me was actually the etymology of both of those words, and that the clues or the, and the answers, I think, are within the definitions of those um, two words. Mm -hmm. um, and so you say that pornography has this Greek root, um, which means female captive um, or harlot, akin to the word meaning to sell, and graphos, which is writing about or the description of. And erotica is a word that you think sort of can begin to mm change, save lives, and it comes from the Greek root sexual desire or passionate love. Um, so two very different, two very different um, meanings there. Do you think that when you speak out against pornography, people mistake that as you being sort of like anti-sex or anti -sexual? Not if they know what sex is, you know, I mean, <laughs> as I always say to audiences of men, you know, cooperation beats domination, trust me, you know, sir. <laughs> No, I, look, I, I think we are so inundated by pornography that, that what I learned from us talking, talking to each other, yeah. yeah, is just how prevalent it is, so prevalent that you almost, we can't imagine anything else. And it presents itself as sex. So, the, the, my best analogy for this is where we started with rape. Those of us who are older here will remember that rape was considered to be inevitable. It was considered really to be only possible if a woman was a virgin. Uh, it was uh, what men said to women about it was, oh, you're supposed to lie back and enjoy it. I mean, there, you know, there was really no differentiation of rape from sex. And we have spent a lot of time, and I think with a fair amount of success, explaining that rape is not sex, it's violence, right? Now, that's taken, I don't know, 30 years or something to, to get that conceptually across to most folks. It does not mean that rape does not happen, obviously, but it means we condemn it instead of blaming it on the victim and saying, what did you have on? You invited it, you know, all the things that, that happened before. All right, I fear that if we let, if we don't begin to differentiate pornography from erotica, violence from, from pleasure, uh, that, that it, will, it will seem, it will win because it will encompass all of sex. And, you know, so I, I we'll, we'll see what happens. And each of you here, you know, think what you feel about this, but I find it helpful to at least have a word for sex that is mutual and pleasurable and not about domination and pain and violence and humiliation and so on. And I think we kind of know when we look even at representations of sex, whether both people want to be there yeah. or whether, you know, it's all about the masculine role dominating and power differences and, you know, it, it, I really do worry, we both, this was the end of our discussion, right, we're both worried about the envelopment of the earth in pornographic images because of the web and just young people especially, uh, I mean, the, the right wing on the one hand, right wing just in a general way, is suppressing sex education and uh, allowing or profiteering off pornography. So young people look at pornography and think that's it, that that's what it's supposed to be. I don't know the answer, but I, I was hoping that maybe having a word, erotica, which at least, at least maybe there are other words, but at least some different word for, for shared, mutual, pleasurable, empathetic, 
sex, real, real, you know, pleasurable sex, would help us to do something about erotica, because, I mean, about pornography, because now there's just no other word, really. If it, all words welcome here, if you have some other ideas about how to do this. <laughs> um, it's interesting because while I was able to definitely differentiate or understood rape to be an act of violence, not just another kind of sex that sometimes happens, um, it was difficult for me to imagine. I just sort of thought that it was an inevitable part of culture and society, that it was just something that was going to happen. And having done, you know, there are cultures that exist in the world where it just doesn't happen, where it's just not a statistic. And um, I know that you've done a lot of traveling and you've done a lot of studies of these other cultures and these other ways of, of setting things up where that doesn't happen. Um, but it, I have to say, hearing you speak as well at the same time, it's difficult for me to imagine a world where pornography doesn't exist. I think it's, well, it not, just seems not, to be, it's so... I, I don't know. It's may, maybe not existing is a long way off, but having an alternative. Yes. Well, right. that's, that I definitely right. think is possible. We should be creating lots of awesome, great alternatives to pornography. <laughs> <laughs> no, and I, you know, I think about um, the, say, the Native American cultures on my land, my North America, and uh, some of the other oldest cultures in Africa and in India and so on. I mean, the whole idea of sexuality was really very different. You know, I've been, I, I started to read Col uh, Christopher Columbus's letters. You want to read about a bad guy, you should definitely read. <laughs> he, he, the, because he, he arrived and, and was so, was writing down, you know, how wonderful and welcoming everyone was and how gentle and how they offered food and so on. And um, then he, he took some of the women's sex slaves for his crew. And he was shocked that they fought back. He could not understand. <laughs> you know, the next Columbus Day, I'm going to put a big sign in Columbus Circle in New York that says murderer <laughs> underneath the <laughs> But it, it, there, where, where there were cultures where women controlled their own reproduction and with herbs and abortifacients and timing and so on, and there was uh, there were, there, in the old cultures, there mainly seemed not to have been even uh, gendered pronouns, not even he and she. People were people. What a concept. <laughs> uh, and it was about a circle as a paradigm, not a hierarchy. So it, it's not, it's not, I just say that because we otherwise think it's human nature, you know, to dominance and hierarchy. It's not, it's actually rather new in human history, mm. at least there were alternatives before, we don't know exactly, but at least there were um, huge cultures that functioned on the idea that we are all linked, we are not ranked. Yeah. Yes. Um, I wanted to go back to your book for a minute because one of my favorite things about the book was opening the first page and seeing the dedication that you made. And when you're sharing such kind of intimate and personal experiences from your own life. Um, does it ever take you a minute to think, wow, do I really want to share this? Do I really want to make this um, public? Um, do you ever, how does that, what, how well, does well, that mental process? In real life, in real life, it took me from, from when I was a, a new college graduate here working in an espresso in Mayfair as a waitress, <laughs> uh, realizing I was pregnant because I had broken an engagement at home and I was on my way to a fellowship in India. Uh, okay, that was 1957. It took me f from then till 1972 when we published a petition from women who'd had abortions in Ms. Magazine saying we have had abortions, we demand, you know, uh, uh, the... the decriminalization of it. So that's a long time. I mean, I didn't talk about it for a long time either. But I hope it's much easier now f for, I, and I think it's important that we tell the truth. That's how we 
find out what's happening in, in the world to all of us. One in three women in, in this country and one in three women in my country has needed an abortion at some time in her life. So, you know, why are we being silent about it? And in an odd way, my coming back now is kind of saying thank you to this country, which was slightly less cr crazy than my country. <laughs> and so, uh, I was able to find a doctor here who was a wonderful man who took a huge risk of his own profession and who said, you, you know, uh, it, it, you still had to have two people, two physicians signing as you do, though I know you're trying to change that. Uh, but the conditions under which they could sign were way, way more stringent. So he said he would take this huge risk if I promised him two things. One, I would never tell anyone his name, and two, I would do what I wanted to do with my life. So I dedicated this book to him. Uh, yeah, I was really moved by the dedication. Yeah. <laughs> so I've come back a half century later to say thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, just still on that topic, in terms of, you know, immunity to pain, loss, disease, the toughness sometimes of this world in general, um, what have you found to be, if it's not too personal, your best defense coping mechanism? What sort of kept you sane when challenges have seemed? Friends. I mean, you, you know, we're, we're communal animals. We need each other. If we're by ourselves, we come to feel crazy or wrong. <laughs> and what, what is the source of all change, or part, the mechanism of, of all beginning of change, is small groups of people supporting each other. I mean, in the Chinese revolution, it was called speaking bitterness groups. In the civil rights movement in my country, it was in the southern churches. Uh, speaking truth about racism. In the women's movement, it was people and is women. Actually, they used to call them CR groups and rap groups. Now they call them book clubs. <laughs> really? <laughs> I, I know. I've been so, amazed. My group, my no, really. So it's, it's yeah. that, it, you know, it, it is the ability to say what's troubling you, to tell your bad experience, find out you're not alone, other people... Surf I mean, you know, that's it. We haven't been sitting around a campfire for millennia upon millennia for nothing. We need to be together, tell stories, see what's common. If they're common problems, they're probably political. Otherwise, it wouldn't be happening to the unique yeah. people, right? And if we get together, we can change them. You talk about the importance of bearing witness to somebody else's pain or loss or suffering, and I was really moved by that as well. I think, I remember when I was younger feeling very panicked when someone was emotional, suffering, having a really hard time, because I thought that my role was to find a way to fix it as quickly as possible or to try to get them to stop crying as quickly as possible. How, what could I possibly, how, what can I do to help? And this would give me this sort of panicky feeling because often I didn't have answers. And then one day when I came to the realization that oftentimes the, the kindest and most meaningful and important thing that I could do would just be to witness someone else in that moment, not even necessarily touching them, hugging them, giving them tissues, going out in the water, doing all of these things I used to like flap around doing, and actually just to sit and be comfortable with mm -hmm. listening to someone else in these difficult moments. Mm -hmm. and, it, and it really set, set me free in that way, and, and I think, I hope, helped me be a better friend by mm -hmm. just being not uncomfortable around um, being with someone else in a really mm -hmm. tough space or, or place. And I, th I, know, I thought you described that really well and mm. really resonated. It sounds to me like you do it really well. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I, well, I hope so. It's, it means a lot to me when people sit and listen to me when I'm on one of my, uh, you know, having one of those days, one of, one of those, I can't do it days. Um, 
Rebecca Traster wrote a, an article recently for New York Magazine, and she argues that single women or unmarried women are now arguably the most powerful voting group this year in this, in this presidential election. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm interested. There have been times in my life when I have felt I just don't know enough. I don't know enough about these potential candidates and I, you know, and will it make that much difference? And, you know, I've really, I, I don't know enough to feel like I can make a decision. And with the media being the way that it is, I'm really interested, what do you think is the most empowering way that a young person can find out information and make a, a decision about who, about a, a, you know, a candidate that they would mm -hmm. want to support? And if they feel that there isn't someone that they really want to support, do you have, how would you offer advice around, mm -hmm. around that? <laughs> When I have Trump in my country saying, <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry, with, 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 I'm um, I would say that it's entertaining, but it's yeah, no, slightly it's, terrifying. It's, it's too dangerous because he's a yeah. brand, you know, yeah. so people know his name and they think because he is, has a lot of money that he's smart. <laughs> and. <laughs> And, and he, actually when people are asked why they s support him, they do say because he's a successful businessman. So I would just like to say that he is not a successful businessman, he is a s successful con man. It's very different. It, somebody figured out that if he had just taken the money that he, in <laughs> the money that he inherited and invested it, he would be better off than he is now. <laughs> because he's gone bankrupt and he's, you know, inflicted his debt on other people and so on. Um, so, you know, we have lots of political problems, but I think we have to understand that the one place on earth where the least powerful equals the most powerful is the voting booth. It is not the most we can do, but it is the least we can do. And you know, there's really, we just need to invest some time in finding out from trusted sources, uh, you know, what the issues are and understand that it's, that things don't change overnight. You know, they're not magic solutions, but what is practically possible to move forward and trust your instinct. You know, I mean, you, you know, authenticity, when you see it, probably, you know, that it, it's so valuable. Um, don't fail to, to trust yourself. Not voting is a way of voting. So, you know, use it and move forward. Here, here's my best thing about instinct. If it walks like a duck and looks like a duck and quacks like a duck and you think it's a pig, it's a pig. <laughs> <laughs> The most compelling, one, this, was honest, this was one of my favorite chapters in your book, was when you recounted your experiences of you know, working on various different campaigns and, and you know, on the campaign trail and, and what that was like. But I loved, for the want of a nail, the shoe was lost. For the want mm. of a shoe, the horse was lost. For the, want of a, yeah, for the want of a rider, the battle was lost. And for the want of a battle, the kingdom was lost. And all for the want of a horseshoe nail. Mm. And it just kind of, and, and, you know, when you talked about how close the um, election between uh, Al Gore and, and Bush was, and, you know, it came down to, mm -hmm. it really came down to a horseshoe's nail. I mean, it really, yeah, it I'm, really I'm, did. I, I um, won't put you through the whole thing, but the, it starts with about two or 3,000 votes in Missouri, and Harriet Woods, who was running for the Senate there, who lost because of a, a lack of money purely because she couldn't answer charges at the last minute. And uh, because of that, the senator who was reelected took Clarence Thomas with him to Washington. And because Clarence Thomas was there, he was visible as a rare uh, African-American conservative willing to go against his own community. And that, you know, he's, he successfully gets onto the Supreme Court. And because of the single vote that stops the recount, uh, in the election of Gore and Bush, and elects Bush, 
And because of that, we have a war in Iraq. We have, you know, two wars in Afghanistan. We have a bigger division of wealth, more prisons than, I mean, you know, it's, it's in there. It's, you know, like this, and it's all true. So for want of the nail, <laughs> you know, you end up with um, three wars and, and the most polarized rich-poor situation we've had in our country almost since the Depression, yeah. as well as giving federal money to religious groups, which he did based on, on just uh, presidential privilege, and it, it's like a vote delivery system. You know, so it began to take over the Republican Party. And it just, you know, started with a few thousand votes. So I, I put that in there because I think it's one of those things you learn over time. And, and I know, I mean, you know the equivalents here that I don't know. Uh, but it's, it's crucial, it's crucial. Just a few votes can make a huge difference. And I remember in my country when Richard Nixon invented the idea and publicized the, oh, politics is dirty, your vote doesn't count. He was just trying to suppress the vote because he knew he couldn't win on a good voter turnout. I found you talking about trusting your instincts and how important your vote was, what a massive, massive, massive difference it could make to the turn of history and historical events. And um, yeah, just the way that you put it so eloquently, I found it very empowering and persuasive. Um, so but there, I'm sure there are great examples here. We should all start trading our examples because I think it's one way that we can inspire each other's activism. Uh, I want to move to you as a writer and, and some, of your, some of your books, um, some of your other books. Um, you wrote one called Revolution from Within, which is about self-esteem. And I wanted to know why you thought this topic and, and self-esteem was kind of the key to revolution and, and the, key to, the key to so many things. Um, well, it, partly it was because of wandering around my country and other countries, I just saw such valuable, incredible women especially, some men too, um, who, who were great and didn't think they were great, you know? So, and so I started to look for books that I could, that would be helpful. And I, I could find books that were external about activism and books that were internal about self-esteem, but not that connected one to the other. You know, that you value yourself and your, and your actions and your opinion and f find other people, you know, that it's a, it's a circle. So I decided I had to write it myself. <laughs> it was a big revelation for me or a big waking up for me that it was very profitable for me to feel really bad about myself as a woman. Very profitable <coughs> indeed. And um, once I started to sort of, once this idea had started to, once I'd really come to understand this idea, um, I was able to really shut down a lot of mm -hmm. self So explain, explain what you mean by profitable. I mean that, gosh, you just, feeling terrible about yourself makes you want to go and change yourself in some way. That you aren't okay as you are, you aren't acceptable as you are, that in order to be worthy, lovable, appreciated, attractive, you are not okay as you are. This requires improvement, change, uh, and, quite ser and, and quite serious, quite, quite big changes, often. Uh, and I think, you know, that's been very empowering, because I never, I, I was, I think, I hadn't connected to these ideas, and I was, as you say, without friends, sort of alone, thinking to myself, gosh, this is just me, I'm just this way, it must be, you know, uh, this must just be a problem with me. And then you start talking to other women about how they feel about themselves, and it's like a five-hour conversation. It's like a, it's like a <coughs> I hate everything kind of a moment, a lot, a lot of the time. I mean, I can't, generalize, obviously it's not the case across the board, but 
I was disturbed by how long I could continue a conversation with most women about things that they didn't like about themselves or their appearances. Um, this, was, this was troubling to me. Um, this was very troubling to me. Um, so, I've lost where I was going with this. I'm just answering your question. No, I'm going. answering your question. Okay, so I'm fine. No, so no, you can no, take you're absolutely here. right. And, and the, as long as the fault can be located in the uh, powerless person, they will stay powerless yeah. because they're blaming themselves. Yeah. So there are whole industries, you know, devoted to making women feel if they just look different, had breast implants, fixed their noses, did, right, to, uh, uh, to making people of color feel if they were just uh, not as dark skinned yeah. or if they just straightened their, I mean, hello, you know, it's, <laughs> and it, it's all around us and it is, it is huge and it is difficult uh, yeah. and we, I had a 12 year old explain to me the other day that she was getting fat. I was like, you're just going through puberty. Do you get to give yourself any kind of, mm. you know, of a break here? I mean, it, it, that made, I was emotional after that conversation. Mm. I really hated that no, conversation. We, we need to, I think we're worried about our time over here. <laughs> Are we going on too long? Oh, we want group questions. Oh no, I have to, I have to, oh okay, I have to ask <laughs> questions from my book club because well, back to, back to this, you know, just a minute on our subject. Off, yeah. I do think that um, there are some things that help. Sports that help. Sports help because sports tell women, especially, that our bodies are not just ornaments, they are instruments. You know, they're meant to do things. Hello? Yeah, they serve a purpose. Yeah, and, and uh, going to... Uh, I wrote a whole thing once about going to my first health club ever because there were, I was looking at women's bodies in the steam room and I realized that each body on its own made total sense without the ridiculous little bra and the thing you know, that referred to some other ideal. You know, one woman looked like a Buddha, somebody else looked, you know, and the, and the, the scars uh, from cesareans were like warrior scars, you know. <laughs> It's, it's, it's hard because there's a big effort to keep us from rebelling and there's a lot of money to be made. But I hope that each of us, men and women, can go home and look in the mirror and say, yes, this is band fucking tastic. <laughs> I want to ask you one more question that's connected to this, and then I'm going to, and then I'm going to move on to the other ones. But so, as a feminist, when you get ready in the morning and you put yourself together, um, there's a kind of misconception, I think, um, that in order to be a feminist, you know, there are like all of these invisible rules, um, which mean that you know you shouldn't, you can't wear heels, or you can't wear makeup, or you know, body hair, no body hair. Um, I mean, I'm gonna, I have an answer as well, but mm -hmm. I'm interested, when you put yourself together, what kind of things do you, what, what do you think about? Um, well, I used to have a rule, anything I could do in 20 minutes was okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and over time, I've developed a kind of uniform, you know, which is black pants, some kind of top, a, some weird belt that you can... <laughs> so, but I, I think that body decoration is a human impulse and, and men as well as women. If you, have you ever seen the Omo people in the uh, valley between, in Africa? Well, it, look up on, on your cell phones, look up OMO <laughs> and look at these people who, women and men, boys and girls, decorate themselves every day you know, with natural clay and paints and flowers. It's beautiful. There's nothing wrong with body decoration. It's beautiful. But the question is, why can't men do it? And why do women have to do it? You know, why can't we do it with joy and imagination? Oh. So far as it's a choice and it, feel, and it makes you feel good and you feel empowered, I, I don't think there, there can be any rules. Um, so, our shed shelf, my book club. 
Maria wants to know, uh, in your opinion, how has feminism changed in the digital age now that women from all over the world can be informed and empowered through the internet? Has the balance of equality shifted in any mm. way? Well, it, you know, it's obviously great that we can get information and safety and the safety of our homes, uh, that we can find each other. It's also obviously true that it's not the same as meeting. <laughs> you know, you're not, you're not empathizing with all five senses. And pressing send is not activism, okay? <laughs> uh, it, it's, it's also true that it is divisive and polarizing because the huge majority of illiterates in this country, in this world, are female. Uh, and many, many, many millions of women do not have electricity, do not have money for a computer. You know? So it, it, you know, it can be divisive and we must be aware of that. Here's my dream for technology. I think that we should have a big um, you know, satellite in the sky broadcasting in all kinds of different languages. And there should be, you know those wind-up radios that you don't even need um, electricity for, you know? Uh, so each woman on the ground can get a program in her own language. <laughs> I mean, I, I just think technology is wonderful, but let's democratize it. Let's try to spread it as widely as, as we can. And, uh, and there is also the opposite end of it, which is that females on the web get a lot more punishment, a lot more harassment, a lot more cruelty, a lot more threats. Uh, and, you know, we have to understand too, that in the absence of five senses, we're able to be more cruel to each other than we are when we're actually present. Uh, what do you say to people who believe that feminism is just about hatred of men? And that's from Raphael, who's in, from Brazil. Well, I could send them to the dictionary. <laughs> there you go. That's good. Uh... Men are feminists too. It's why we chose the word. You know, I kind of liked women's liberationist as a word, but feminist we chose because men could be feminists too. Do you have any role models? And if so, who are they and why? And that's from Romina. Oh, there's so many. There's so many. Uh, when you say that, I think of uh, Wilma Mankiller, the chief of the Cherokee Nation, who's should have been president of the United States in any fair situation. An amazing woman who knew how to create independence, not dependence. Incredible gift. Um, Alice Walker, uh, I think is, I always think of her as a head of me on the path. <laughs> she's, she's our book four. I yes, she's, she's number two yes. on your book club yes. and I'm so grateful and I mean that how great is it that, that I'm there and Alice Walker is there and is that not, we didn't know, we didn't lobby, we didn't do anything. We're so honored <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and to be chosen, so I'm just no. totally knocked out with this, right? No, that's, oh, that's craziness. This is us getting to be here and still being able to talk to you who wrote these things that mean so much to us is remarkable and a complete gift. So it's really, it's really our, it's really our honor. Um, I want to try and get a few more questions in because they'll be mad at me otherwise. Um, <laughs> oh, this is an interesting one. Does she believe, do you believe, that the word feminism should change to humanism? Would it be easier for men to embrace feminism if the changing the word made it sound like equality for all, not just women? And that's from Jace. Mm. Well, once I went to a lecture I was doing at a big kind of amphitheater in Texas, and there were people outside with, with big placards saying, Gloria Steinem is a humanist. And I thought, oh, how nice. <laughs> I was ignorant of the tradition of the word humanist, which means you don't believe in God, which, you know, they were very pissed off. Uh, they were <laughs> <laughs> is that what it really means? Mm hmm? Yeah. You I mean, you believe, I mean the, well, I'm generalizing, but if you go home or you look and you're, you know, that's what it means, yeah, that you believe in human beings. I'm completely exposing my ignorance here. Um, <laughs> I had thought that it meant that humanism is sort of like you believe in equality for all humans. 
Oh, no. wow, I'm so wrong. <laughs> I mean, history, we can, this is great. the I, meanings change over time, but that's not the origin of, of it. I think that's what, I think that's what it's sort of come to mean, even though I don't think that clearly it's mm -hmm. not the actual definition of it. Well, you know, first of all, we should be able to choose our own word. It's just not, if you don't want to say feminism, fine. Uh, women's liberationist, um, womanism, uh, mujerista, if you're Spanish. <laughs> Uh, girls, I love girls with two or three R's. <laughs> so it's the content that matters, n not, not the word. Not the word. Right. Some people say equalist. That's another word. Yeah. Uh, oh, okay. Mm. It's so hard, there's so many good ones. Okay. I would love, Michelle is saying that she would love to hear you talk more about the Houston National Women's Conference. Do you believe something like this could happen again? Mm -hmm. And if it were held today, do you think, how do you think the conference would be different from what it was like in 1977? Mm -hmm. How have the issues changed since then? You know, this, uh, I, I don't want to go on about this because uh, probably most people in my country don't know about it much less, but it was a, uh, it was a two-year process in which in every state and territory, delegates were elected and issues were selected uh, by huge numbers of people. I mean, in the capital of New York State, there were 2,000 people just there. And it also, because of, of its guidelines, was uh, maybe the only racially, economically, ethnically representative meeting I've ever seen in my country. And we decided then, uh, those delegates voted on a um, program that we all agreed on. And so it caused us to unify uh, around, yes, uh, anti-lesbian sentiments or a feminist issue, you know, this is, uh, or around reproductive rights and abortion, which were still controversial then. So it, it was like writing a constitutional convention for women. So it, it, I describe it in the book, and there are other books completely devoted to it, if you want to look at it and see whether you think that this would be useful in, in some way. Uh, wh what are possible solutions to a misogynistic media? How can average citizens and voters either change flawed mass media or simply be sure they are receiving reliable news and information free of biased and destructive mm. misogyny? And that's from Amy. Uh, well, I think this is on the agenda of your new women's party, is it not? Changing the media? Yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, uh, and lots of other violence, everything, you know, great. <laughs> thank you, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. I appreciate that. <laughs> you want that. to repeat what she said? Sorry? Oh, no, no. Do you want to repeat what... Oh, she was just saying that she has more information for me if I'd like it. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, you know, there are lots of existing groups devoted to this, and we can find the Women's Media Center in my country. We started to, precisely to do this because we realized that we had had and continued to have a women's health movement, but we didn't have a women's media movement, you know. So it, it, it's very important we have our own media now more bef than we did before, obviously, but the advertising supported big media, the ownership of the media is very restricted to five big corporations around the world, hello, and also the ad content. So I think there are any number of ways we can protest to individuals, we can re boycott the uh, products that are advertise and y you know and we can hook into the women's party to the <laughs> women's media center to any group we know that's working on the media and understand it's really important because it's possible for the media to make you feel that it is right and you are wrong it's amazing you know, so we need, we need a more realistic media. I'm going to ask you one more quick question, and then we're going to ask questions from the audience. But uh, Sarah says, any ideas on how to teach our sons equality? My youngest is seven. They split sports into separate sexes this year, and I'm not sure how to explain to him why. Mm. 
Well, I think it's, it's how we treat our boys. You know, do we, we don't say to them, don't cry or be tough or whatever. <laughs> you know, we kind of try to let them be who they are. Uh, it's wonderful for boys to take care of littler children. It makes them feel grown up. And there's a wonder, there was a great project in, in New York called Oh Boy Babies. Sixth grade little boys took care of babies in childcare centers. And at first they said they were kind of, oh, they pee and they, you know. But then of course they just said, babies are interesting. <laughs> you know, they were interested. And also it made them feel grown up. And the, the program got its name because they would say, um, you know, whenever the two days a week came up, oh boy, babies. <laughs> So, in a general way, I think women, girls, become whole people by venturing out into what is wrongly called masculine and isn't. And boys stay whole people by venturing out into, you know, what is wrongly called feminine and isn't. And then we get to be whole people. Okay, questions from everyone. Or answers, room. answers. Yeah. <laughs> Organizing yeah, announcements. Yes. Um, thank you very much. That was just so inspiring and so energizing. Um, I work with refugee women in the UK. And first of all, um, moving on from what you said about the importance of activism, I'd like to invite you both and everybody here to a gathering we're having on International Women's Day right out there outside the Home Office at one o'clock to stand up for women who cross borders and need safety, particularly in the current refugee crisis. And Gloria, can you say something about your experiences of building solidarity across borders, borders of nations, races, classes, genders? Mm -hmm. Thanks very much. You know, it's, I realize that, you know, obviously the refugee question is huge now, right? But also, I think because of the particular nature of some refugees movements, we have come to think that there are more that refugees in general around the world are more male than they are, when actually it's 90% women and children refugees. So, you know, we we need to remember that. And as for working together, um, do we know each other? Is is the first question I think. In, in New York, there was an African-American women's group, very big and important, and a Jewish uh, uh, women's group, very big and important. They were trying to do things together, and that never happened, right? So they called up a friend of mine who was a feminist conflict resolution expert, <laughs> <laughs> which she became out of running two women's centers, okay? So she became a conflict resolution <laughs> And uh, they called her in as a consultant, and she said, well, do your presidents know each other? And they said, well, no, not really. She said, tell them to have lunch together, you know, every week for a while, and it'll work, and it did. I mean, who do we know? Who do we trust? Nothing replaces trust. Uh, who do we go to the movies with? It's the bell hooks rule. If you buy shoes together, you can do politics together. <laughs> <laughs> so I would say that's the first question that all of us can answer. Who are our friends? Do we have friends different from us? And if not, why not? We're not learning. If we're learning, we don't learn so much from sameness. Another question. Hi. <laughs> I'm Lisa from Germany, and uh, I just want to go back to a topic that you mentioned before briefly, um, which is very interesting and which I plan to do research on, and that is female sexuality. Um, and I think that, in my opinion, that this is sort of a key to uh, equality on its own. And I just want to ask your opinion about this because I think it's not just about pornography, it's also about uh, mm -hmm. women understanding their own sexuality and being, well, strong about it in their, in their opinion, in their feeling. And also women's magazines, you know, writing about how to best please him. It's all about men and, and not about women. And I just want to ask your opinion about mm -hmm. uh, how this is a key in, in equality. Yes, no, it is the key, it is a key because how we got in this jam in the first place <laughs> of patriarchy and other bullshit, you know, is because of trying, trying to control reproduction. And that meant controlling women's bodies. And that meant uh, pleasure was, uh, that animated individual women was dangerous. So we got everything from uh, 
restriction in non, you know, in rooms to female genital mutilation to telling us to Freud telling us that there was a kind of orgasm that did not physiologically exist. Uh, my name is Jude Kelly. I started the Wow Festival here. Uh, and this will be. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and this will be its sixth year. And it, the Women's Equality Party was born from that last year. Um, two years ago, I started a festival called BAM, Being a Man. And this is the root of my question. That if women's consciousness raising, which has been going formally for, formally for a de uh, hundred years, a lot longer, forever really, but men's consciousness raising is a very new territory. And my worry is that if this is the third wave of feminism, then it could also ebb as much as it's flowing at the moment. And unless male consciousness raising gets included in male agenda, then I fear that we will ebb again. And, and that's my question, really. Do you think that, as is true, do you think there's more we can do about that? And of course, that can't just be women urging men forward. It's got to be men coming forward. Mm -hmm. Thank you. There is, I think in both our countries, there is a fairly substantial men's movement. Of, of men saying, wait a minute, I'm not going to be limited to this, you know, dehumanized masculine role. Uh, and meeting together in order to support each other in this defiance of a masculine role, which is not easy, and also to support women. There's men's groups working against violence against women, too. Um, so, you know, thank you for making that visible and thank you for supporting it. And yes, absolutely. I think it's why we started, why I wanted to start with the UN was to start He For She, was to create a conversation that felt inclusive. Um, I think uh, feminism becoming synonymous with man-hating or is, is really damaging and, and really... Um, just incorrect. Um, so I think the more we talk about that, the more that we try and open up a space in which, I mean, it's really wonderful to see men in this room. And thank you for coming. And, um, mm -hmm. and actually, we have endless research about how if you eliminate from the statistics of as to why men die, the things most associated with the masculine role of, of, of violence and speeding and tension related to, you live four or five years longer. I mean, whatever, what other movement can offer you? <laughs> and, and, you know, to see men with their children really being loving and caring towards their children is just... A, a gift to everyone. I, I owe my father too, because he was a wonderful, loving, patient man, and therefore he's personally responsible for the fact that I am still friends with all my old lovers, <laughs> because they were nice people. <laughs> well, maybe there was a one. <laughs> um, hi, um, I'm Rosie Boycott, and. Um, Gloria and I started Spare Rib around the time that Gloria started Ms. Hi, Gloria. Um, Where are you? No, what, what strikes oh, me as very scary nowadays is that um, my partner, Marsha, and I started a magazine as you started Ms. We set out with the aim to try to change everything. And the worst that happened to us was that we were told we were silly. I mean, that was really it. We were silly and we would fail. You come forward 40-odd years and... Caroline Criado Perez, who I'm sure lots of people in this room know of, she went out and she said, why isn't there a woman on a banknote? Which seems to me a much less kind of offence against man than what we tried to do. The result for her was death threats, police protection, tweets and messages and emails that were of such vileness and perversion and violence to her. And it scares me now that actually it's like one's awoken the monster and in fact, you hear stuff about women being enslaved in this society. Um, that it got much, much, much more ugly. Uh, is that something you found in the States? And also, what do you think about that? Mm -hmm. Well, it's true that there seem to be stages of resistance. You know, when 
the first woman who does something gets resistance, and the, but she's there, and then it's okay until it gets to be about a third, and then, you know, it's like they're saying, there goes the neighborhood or something, you know, that they're worried that we're going to be 50-50, and there's a new stage of resistance. Uh, and now that there is the web where people can be hateful without names and without penalty, this is reflected. Uh, so it's not that the danger isn't real, it is, but it is a, a part of progress, it just is, you know, and we have to look after each other and be aware and reach out to people, men who can help and point it out and know that it's wrong. But we, we can't stop, I mean, the, it, we can't let it frighten us into stopping, we're just trying to find remedies, you know, find ways of dealing with legal threats on the web that is a whole new area of the law, for instance, and stalking on the web and so on. And we need to tell each other and protect each other, but we're not going to stop. Um, I'd like to speak as a supportive man to feminism. Um, also a disabled person, so in a way that fighting another oppression makes one see the links between the different oppressions. And I think that the real answer to feminism is that all men should become feminists, uh, because that's the only way that we're actually going to create a world. We can't do it with just women fighting for this, because uh, there's too many thousands of years of patriarchy, but men have to realise that by being feminist in their relationships in the way they are, they're actually going to have a better life for themselves and for their children and for their partners. And I think that's, that's the first thing I'd want to say. The second thing is everybody in this room is going to be faced with a choice on the 23rd of June. And politicians are deliberately trying to confuse people. But if you see that the U European Union stands for equality and those who are arguing against it don't want equality, it's fairly clear where people need to be going. And the European Declaration of Human Rights comes straight from the universal declaration of human rights and that's what a lot of people don't like and if we don't maintain that bastion would you agree that uh, we are on a downhill slope in this country against equality no the women's rights in the european union right i i agree this is not i'm not going to have to vote right but um i hope and believe <laughs> that folks are not going to go backward, right? You said that um, if you looked like a duck and it felt like a pig, then it was a pig. And therefore, a no vote was just as important as a vote. I come from Australia where it, we have compulsory voting. <laughs> Do you think that by trying to figure out ways to encourage more women to vote, we would therefore have a better representation in in power in Parliament and therefore make changes that way? Yes, in every country that I'm aware of, from, from India to my country to here, there is a gender gap toward candidates, men too, and women, who represent the majority issues of women and represent equality. Um, and we need to create that gender gap and make it vocal. Uh, and I... I think that's what the Women's Equality Party is doing and what we're trying to do. And, you, you know, I mean, even, you know, if it, it, it enunciates the issues, right? E even if the, it's someone from another party who's going to, it, it publicizes the issues, it makes people know what is possible. And we also do our best to do that. And we tend to campaign outside the parties and outside campaigns because actually social justice movements have more credibility than political parties. So, <laughs> so it's very important, I think, to use that credibility. There's nothing more important than a trusted messenger. I, I think we have to draw it to a close there.